Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and I'm joined today by Daniel Kowalik. Daniel is a labor and human rights lawyer teaching human rights at the Pittsburgh School of Law. He has written extensively on international human rights and U.S. foreign policy for the Huffington Post and Counterpunch. He's also the author of numerous anti-war and anti-imperialist books, among others, No More War, The Plot to Control the World, and The Plot to Scapegoat Russia. Daniel is also familiar with the situation in the Donbass. He has spent time in Donetsk last year. Dan, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Um, then I would like to talk to you today about the USA, Russia and Ukraine triangle. But first, can you tell us a little bit more about your background, your work as a human rights lawyer and how you came to write these books against uh, US imperialism? Yes, well, I, I went to Columbia Law School in New York City, graduated there in 1993. But before I even went to law school uh, during college, I went to Nicaragua during the war there, the Contra War. And uh, in 1987, I went back in 1988. And that's really what got me interested in, in anti-imperialism, you know, seeing what the U.S. was doing to Nicaragua at that time. Um, and then I became a lawyer. I worked actually for a union, the United Steelworkers Union here in Pittsburgh for 26 years. Uh, but as part of my work, I did a lot of human rights work in Colombia, South America, um, actually fighting um, against uh, trade union killings in that country. Colombia has been the most dangerous country in the world to be a trade unionist for many years. And I got involved in suing companies that were involved with paramilitaries that were torturing and killing trade unionists. And that's how I got involved specifically in human rights. So I've had a long, uh, long history in anti-imperialism and human rights. Uh, I see. And then last year, if I understand correctly, you decided to visit the Donbass. And a considerable part of your recent work has to do with Russia. And you're very outspoken about it. Uh, you were also on the rally against the war machine, if I, if I got that right, um, recently in Washington, right? So how come that you, um, that you went to the Donbass, I mean, this very contested area? Well, for years, I've been writing about the vilification of Russia. I've been very concerned about the propaganda against Russia. Um, even before that, I was concerned about the propaganda against the Soviet Union. You know, I always felt that Russia and the Soviet Union weren't, were not necessary enemies of the United States. That is, that we could be partners and friends. Um, and I wrote a book in 2017 countering uh, the so-called Russiagate propaganda in my book, The Plot to Scapegoat Russia. And so, of course, naturally, when the intervention of Russia in Ukraine in 2022 happened, I was eager to go to the Donbass region, which, frankly, I've been writing about what's been happening in the Donbass since 2014. Uh, been writing about the fact that the government in Kiev has been attacking their own people in the Donbass. Uh, it's an issue I've been very familiar with, but of course it's become even more important now since the intervention in 2022. So I decided I should go there for myself and see what's happening there, which I did last November. And what did you see? I mean, in November, the referendums were already over and, um, you know, the this consolidation of, let's say, Russia's uh, uh, taking off the Donbass was more or less done. OK, the fighting is not over. There are still parts of the Donbass that are not under Russian control, but the, the political uh, part of the whole procedure was done. What did you see in November? I mean, first of all, what surprised me is how normal things felt. I was in Donetsk City is where I stayed, but I went to Mariupol as well. Um, and I was told, so I saw, you know, the car, there were cars on the streets, people going to restaurants, people going to shops. And I was told that actually things have become much more vibrant since the referenda in, in, 2000, in September 2022. 
uh, people were feeling more protected at that point. And uh, so one, I did see kind of normal life returning to that region, which surprised me a bit. But also I witnessed uh, the fact that Ukraine was shelling civilian targets in Donetsk, including a school while I was there, the soccer stadium, a place where people go to gather water because uh, some time ago the government of Ukraine cut the people off and the Donbass from the water supply. Um, and also a, uh, there, uh, a monastery there was being bombed almost daily uh, by the government in Kiev. So those were the, you know, uh, things that I witnessed. I talked to a lot of people in Donetsk who've been fighting against uh, Ukrainian forces since 2014. I met people who were taken captive both by the, you know, official Ukrainian security services, also though by the Azov Battalion and how they were mistreated and tortured. Um, those were the, the things I saw there. How come that in the West, this issue of the Donbass and the shelling, which obviously happens, which everybody who has even like, who has an internet access, who can like watch anything on YouTube knows about, but never ever gets mentioned on any of the, of the main channels and is never discussed because it is such a clear example of how also Ukraine is shelling its own people for eight years, by the way. Why is it that in the free world with a free press, there is so much propaganda because we are told that propaganda only happens in Russia. That's on China. Those are the only ones. The free states never do that. How how do you how do you explain that? Well, first of all, of course, it's in the interest of governments such as that of the U.S., other Western governments, not to talk about the fact that this war has been going on since 2014. They want the public to believe. The war started in February of last year with the Russian intervention in Ukraine. They don't want people to know that 14,000 people died in the conflict between, again, the government of Kiev and their own people in the Donbass, even before the Russians uh, intervened in February 2022. It's inconvenient to the narrative. Also inconvenient to the narrative is the fact that there are Nazis that are, you know, part of the Ukrainian government military, which, again, anyone in Donbass will tell you is, a, is the fact. Now, what you're also asking is, well, how is it possible, though, even if that is the interest of the Western governments, not to talk about those things? Why are the media who are allegedly independent and free, uh, why are they going along with that narrative? Why are they uh, suppressing the alternative narrative? And that's because they are now owned by major corporations, which themselves have taken you know, these governments captive. I mean, we now have almost a perfect marriage between corporations and the governments, right? And the same corporations own the media, and so, you know, long and short of it is we don't really have a free press, right? We have a press that pretends to be free. And uh, there's a certain amount of discourse allowed in the press, but it's very limited. And, uh, of course, Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman have been writing about this since the 70s, you know, in books like Manufacturing Consent. But it's even worse now. And why is it worse? Because... In the past, at least, newspapers, for example, had people who bought newspapers, right? So they had certain revenue they generated from people, from the public. So they were a, a little bit accountable to the public. Now, no one buys newspapers, right? Um, and so now media outlets are totally dependent on corporate advertising. So not only are they owned by corporations... But they are completely dependent on corporations for their revenue. So now there's almost no space in the media for public, true public discourse. 
And we so we see almost, you know, complete propaganda, especially on foreign policy issues. You know, on domestic issues, you might see a little more debate, but not foreign policy, you know, issues. And, and, and again, we, you know, there's other examples of this, you know, the lead up to the war in Iraq. Right. The government of the U.S. claimed we were going into Iraq because Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Well, a number of people were saying, well, there, there aren't weapons of mass destruction there. But the media suppressed those voices and really, you know, highlighted the voices of those who claimed there were weapons of mass destruction. We went into Iraq. And about a million Iraq, dead Iraqis later, what many of us you know, believed at the beginning is true that there weren't weapons of mass destruction, right? And so we've seen increasingly the media willing to to lie, to shade the truth, to suppress alternative voices in support of war. But you know, it's it's even worse in a sense because as soon as you figure in foreign media in Europe and here in Japan, they parrot, they parrot the talking points of the United States. That's another level that I don't understand. Why is why are, is foreign media that works differently? Japanese media still has like, you know, newspapers have good subscription rates, but they use the same talking points and they go along. Why is this epistemic community so closed that they themselves are kind of uh, uh, happy with uh, with with parroting the same information over and over? Well, I think a number of these Western governments, one, feel economically dependent on the United States. They feel a certain ideological, um, what should I say, kind of simpatico with the United States. Also, some of these countries are semi-occupied, even Japan as U.S. military bases, right? Um, and so I think the governments there are, especially on these types of issues, they're more or less vassals of the United States. I would I would agree when it comes to foreign policy making, but the media is is a funny thing. It's more like they do this out of their own will because they want to believe belong to this, but. Um, Daniel, maybe let's go to to another big question that I have, and that's this um, issue of why neutrality failed for Ukraine. Um, you know, since 2014, and even before that, a, a, a lot of people said that this neutrality for Ukraine is the obvious solution to this problem. It is absolutely, it's a no-brainer. And you, Ukraine was neutral. Ukraine had a neutrality clause in its constitution and everything was fine. And then the coup happened and the uh, Crimea gets uh, gets gets annexed and then the Ukrainian government ditches the, this neutrality clause and then they, they go even stronger with like, yeah, we want to join NATO and Russia says, says even more strongly, stop this. Um, everybody I know, from Noam Chomsky to, uh, to Henry Kissinger to uh, Michael Wald to uh, Anatole Leaf and, and even in, the, in Europe as well, uh, Heinz Gertner and so on, everybody who understands something about the international relations said Ukraine should be another Austria, right? It should it should be neutral, and that would solve the issue. It would it would resolve the Russia security um, concerns, and it would make sure the European Union is safe from Russia. Right? You've got a buffer state. Why? Why did that not happen? This should have been the natural outcome to solve all security issues. Yeah, there's there was one party though who did not want it to be neutral, and that was the United States. The United States helped to bring about the coup in the 2014. The United States helped organize the new government in 2014. We even know this from recorded telephone conversations of people like Victoria Nuland, who talked about them organizing the new government. The U.S. was not happy with Ukraine as a neutral state. They wanted it to be totally pro-Western and even pro-U.S. You might even recall Victoria Nuland, who is, was in the State Department then, is in the State Department now, even said, fuck the EU, right? She said that, right? Uh, it wasn't just about even being in the Western alliance. 
they wanted it fully in the U.S. camp, and they or you know they orchestrated things so that that would happen, and it did happen, and that's what has led us to where we are now. So neutrality in this sense, and also the Minsk agreements, they were never they were never actually a real option because one of the three parties just opposed it uh, fundamentally. Is that it? At least one of the three parties. We know from, though, from Angela Merkel, right, the former chancellor of Germany. We know from President Hollande of France that they also didn't intend to abide by it, right? They've admitted that. Former President Hollande, former Chancellor Merkel have said they never intended the Minsk agreements to work. They simply wanted them to be used to buy time so that Ukraine could arm, rearm against Russia. And so uh, we know that the Minsk agreements, from the Western point of view, was a complete sham. Um, and that, again, is the tragedy here. Had those worked, we wouldn't be where we are now. But again, we've now learned they were never, at least from the Western point of view, intended to work. So uh, I talked to Nikolai Petr on this channel, and he wrote this book about the tragedy of Ukraine. And in his view, uh, the, the, this international war wouldn't have been possible had it not been for the internal ruptures of the Ukrainian society, especially the, Rus um, the well, Russian pro-Russian East and the Galician West, and the Ukrainian West. And uh, the and and this little fraction of uh, Nazis and and uh, ultra right um, fascist forces that are able to capture the entire political process, uh, he says he says this this part is really kind of very small but ultra violent and therefore able to hold uh, politicians in Kiev host, uh, hostage. From your research and also what you've what you've seen in in the Donbass and talked to people. Uh, would you agree with him that this faction is small or is it is it big? How big is the neo-Nazi problem in Ukraine? Well, again, I think however big or small it is, I think the point that he made is true. And that is that they have been able to capture the government. There was a very good expose by Gray Zone, if you follow that, about how when Zelensky was elected in 2019, he was elected on a peace platform, right? He he ran on a platform to make peace with Russia, but he was very quickly told by the neo-Nazis or Nazis, you know, the former president of Uruguay, very beloved uh, uh, President Mujica, said you can't even call them neo-Nazis. They're just straight up Nazis. You know, they told Zelensky, you can't make peace with Russia. You have to. Uh, go after Russia, have to go after the Donbass, or we will kill you. And so clearly the government there is held captive by these Nazi forces. So in your view, how is Russia now intending to to resolve this problem? Because, okay, the West has said there's no neutrality for Ukraine. We will never allow it, right? This would have been the best case scenario. So now the second... Now, Russia will have to go for the second best. And uh, actually, the, UN, the US NATO is also trying to go, they are going to try try to go for the optimum, right? Although this looks increasingly unlikely. Um, but from the R Russian side, what do you think is now going to be their desired outcome? Because like, let's face it, an, an entire capturing of Ukraine is nearly impossible. You can't have 24 million people hostile to you in the in the West who would then fight a guerrilla war against all of your police stations and so on forever. So what do you think will is, is the goal at this point? I think the goal is to maintain the four republics that voted to go with Russia in, two, in 2020, September 2022. Maybe add on Odessa. Um, we'll see. But certainly those four republics. But meanwhile, to totally demilitarize Ukraine. I mean, they are eating up all of Ukraine's military resources. In fact, they're even eating up all of NATO's resources, right? So I think in the end, they, they will have a demilitarized West. 
and they'll have control over the four republics um, that that voted to be with them in September. I think that will be the end. I think that is the ultimate goal here. And on the other hand, what do you think was the goal of the West? You know, like uh, adding Ukraine to NATO, and then what? What would have what would that have served? What purpose would that have served? I think the goal of the West was and is to destroy Russia. And I think the Russians saw that. I think the Russians felt that either they would take this, you know, this battle to Ukraine now, or they'd be fighting on Russian territory. And when you hear various officials of the U.S., who talk about wanting to use Ukraine to weaken Russia, that they'll fight Russia to the last Ukrainian. It's very clear that Russia was on the chopping block. And I think that that, that is still the goal of people, you know, some leaders in Washington. Um, no, nothing about this is about Ukraine, right? This is all about Russia. They wanted to use Ukraine to destroy Russia in the same way that the U.S. used Afghanistan to undermine the Soviet Union. And again, the U.S. ultimately was pretty open about those goals. You know, um, uh, Brzezinski himself wrote about that later. And he wrote about using Ukraine to weaken Russia in his 1997 book, The Grand Chessboard, which, by the way, everyone in Donetsk knows about. When he first talked to people in Donetsk about the conflict, the first thing they mention is the Grand Chessboard. So Ukraine has always been seen by the U.S. as a way to weaken Russia. Uh, and that's going back even to the 1920s. So we are basically back to the 19th century world where war is a tool in order for states to accomplish their kind of interests and missions. And if one of the interests is to destroy a potential peer competitor, then so be it, right? You do it with war and you do it with propaganda. Now, when I look at the United States, what I, especially at the media, what I often perceive is uh, this projection. They project on other nations what, what is actually what they are doing at the moment. And one of the projections right. I see at the moment in the US media is the, the, the lessons China is learning uh, from, from this war for Taiwan. Oh my God. So obviously the US is now thinking about how to have a war with China. Now, on, if we flip the script and say like, what should China and Taiwan learn? How can, how can Taiwan um stop becoming the next ukraine without like you know because you're 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 in between two elephants right so i mean i'm not saying that china is the is the is the solution to have to, to to that problem but what would be your advice to a battlefield that is not yet a battlefield but that is clearly already design uh, designated to become one well, I think Taiwan should look at the lessons of Afghanistan and Ukraine and, first of all, reject those options. They don't want to go there. They do not want to be the next cannon fodder for the United States. That, that's that got to be the first goal. And the fact that people voted in the Kuomintang in the last elections, which, you know, they're not pro-China, but they at least want to make, you know, some kind of rapprochement with them shows that's what the Thai, Taiwanese want to avoid. They want to avoid being cannon fodder for the United States. And that means, again, maybe going to really what you, you know, uh, uh, Yanukovych was trying to do in Ukraine before he was overthrown in 2014. And that is to find a certain kind of balance, a certain neutrality between the two powers. Um and I think that is what Taiwan is looking for right now. Because, again, they do not want to be the next Ukraine. I hope, I hope you're right. There was, There is a politician, the former uh, uh, vice president, Liu Xiulian. She had the idea of making of using neutrality as a term to designate what, what uh, Taiwan is in order also to avoid the sovereignty issue, which I think is quite brilliant. But it's much more complex than for Ukraine. For Ukraine, it was easy and easy to see. For uh, Taiwan, it would be very, very uh, tough because of the political situation. Um, I just wonder, you know, people like you and, and you know, also Jimmy Dore and the Grey Zone and uh, these great journalists and 
uh, academics, Petro and Leafen and, and so on, uh, you know, we, we yell at the top of our lungs that this is dumb, this is stupid, this is very dangerous, stop it, we are slaughtering others. Uh, the West is more culpable of this war in Ukraine than Russia is, although, you know, there's, there's, there's blame to distribute on every side. But how can we, how, what can we do against this war machine, this, this abomination in the West, and I, like Europe and Japan is part of that, that this stops? How do we help stop this war machine? Well, the only thing we can really do effectively, and Noam Chomsky writes about this, we're responsible for our own governments, right? We, we live in ostensibly democratic con- countries, right? They're flawed democracies, of course, limited democracies, but still, they're ostensibly democratic countries. So we need to prevail on our own countries, our own governments, to find peaceful solutions to these conflicts, to stop arming Ukraine, to stop finding, you know, looking for military ways to uh, resolve conflicts and to look for peace and negotiations. That's what we have to do. And if we have to take to the streets to do that, we need to do that, right? And of course, in Japan, there's a long tradition of doing that, of, you know, peace demonstrations, particularly in places like Okinawa. And uh, the U.S. has a long, you know, tradition of that as well. And I think we're finding that peace movement here again. And that's what's critical. You're absolutely right about that, Dan. Thank you very much for for these words. Um, Your analysis has been very um, uh, insightful. So I hope we can keep that discussion up and also create a global movement against this war machine. Uh, Dan Kovalik, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it.